So ladies and gentlemen, our next presenter is none other than our former technology minister. I'm sure he is as excited about this conference. What a perfect timing for something like this. And I'm sure he has lots to share with us. Let's welcome Mr. Philip Powell, MP, CD. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. I greet you. I greet my colleague, Minister of Tourism, Minister Bartlett, His Excellency, High Commissioner Naik, our host, Erica, ladies and gentlemen, and our international audience, good morning. No, man, this energy inside here not, not working. Good morning. good morning. I am indeed delighted to be here this morning to participate in this very important Global Digital Marketing Summit. I'm so sorry that I'm not gonna be able to stay and learn as much as you all, but um, Ed will tell you that I have to go to PAAC this morning to continue some interrogations. So, and I'm sure you'll forgive me for leaving early. But I think it is fair to say that your annual event has grown over the years exponentially. And I want to congratulate the organizers and wish you continued growth and success as you provide an important service in a really cutting edge industry. This online conference is bridging the gap of distance through the exciting and practical application of available technology. The management of one's digital presence is as critical today as the management of your money. In many respects, management of digital presence is in fact the management of money. It saves money and represents a wise investment. The fascinating lineup of presentations illustrate the importance for both personal and commercial benefits of the digital economy of, of online platforms, platform enabled services and the supply of ICT goods and services. I trust that all the participants will be empowered by the information sharing that the platform of this conference provides. I'm not going to be speaking about marketing. Um, it is far more proficient than I am, but I want to speak about the substratum, what enables and facilitates all of this. And it is said that success happens when hard work meets opportunity. The social and economic opportunities of the digital revolution have been in the making for some time. They emerged just around the turn of the 21st century in the early 2000s. I'm delighted and honored to have been part of the generation and the political administration at that time that put in the hard work to meet these opportunities and to create the success that we are building on today. The Global Digital Marketing Summit has correctly acknowledged that without the groundbreaking achievements of liberalization of our telecom sector in Jamaica in the late 1990s, the digital, would, the digital world would have remained essentially closed off to the people of Jamaica. The business opportunities that abound and which are earning millions of Jamaican corporations and enterprising individuals would not have been capitalized on. The amazing range of creative and technical digital skills that are being developed and unleashed would not have been tapped and honed. Jamaica would have been lagging and the plain catch up with the rest of the world. Our society and economy would not have been as integrated as we are in the global information and, and commercial flows as we undoubtedly are today. And as I mentioned before, my good friend, Minister Bartlett, can tell you about the phenomenal growth that tourism is experiencing, driven by online bookings, digital marketing, and the runaway success of Jamaica's connectivity to online platforms such as Airbnb. I don't think that anyone here in this audience, today or online in any corner of the globe, would disagree with the assertion that the liberalization of our telecoms industry will go down as one of the most significant milestones in Jamaica's development. It required and came about because of careful planning, a great vision of Jamaica and its place in the world, courage, and an unshakable commitment to Jamaica's development. You know, Ed, I was speaking to some young people recently, 
and I was telling them that the very first time I got a telephone line in my house. We had to break champagne bottles to celebrate. And many of them can't imagine that when I picked up the phone to make my first call from my home, I got a phone. When I picked up the phone, I heard somebody on the line. And I was told that this is a party line. And the young people just can't imagine that there was such a time in Jamaica, especially with the cost that when you use your cell phone to make a call, you pay for the call, but the person who is receiving that call also pays. And in those days, it was like $130 per minute. Young people, those who were born after 1999 can't appreciate that. But starting in 1999, with the dismantling of some five exclusive licenses granted to Cable and Wireless with 25 years currency plus a further 25 years. So think about it. Those licenses would still be valid up to the year 2038. We are in 2018 now. So we would still have one telecoms provider to this time and 20 more years to go. That is the magnitude of what we are able to achieve. So Telecom civilization was by no means an accident. It was not an afterthought. It was a carefully planned undertaking that considered the multidimensional impact in the short, medium, and long term. It accounted for much of the, the discussions at National Planning Council and the Cabinet at that time. When full liberalization was achieved in 2003, making Jamaica the first of the English-speaking Caribbean countries to embark on a path of market liberalization in telecoms. We are really delivering on commitments that were contained in the five-year development plan, 1990 to 95, and the national industrial policy. In Jamaica, we got our house in order just in time, and we are really ready um, and continue to, to be so for the global digital wave that came in the early 2000s. Just look at phenomenal growth of, say, Digicel, the first new telecoms company that took advantage of liberalization. When we asked the incumbent at the time, what's your projection for cell phones over the next 10 or so years? And we were told, well, we probably get to about 90,000 in 10 years. Um, in one month, Digicel surpassed 100,000, and we are over 3 million today, and, and, and I know um, you, you, you have not yet gone with the two phones, um, but I do. So what are the benefits of connecting Jamaica for integrated? And, 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 and we should note, you know, all of what we're seeing in the digital economy has, has its basis in the liberalization of telecommunication. The exponential growth in cell phone subscribers from uh, about 60,000 to over 3 million presently is but a small part of that revolution and the benefits and its impact. The opening up of social and economic opportunities in the digital world has been far-reaching, improving platform for marketing Jamaica and overseas, unlocking billions of dollars in investment through the business process outsourcing, which is now worth more than $400 billion and growing. And in that sector alone, again, it has its genesis, the tremendous growth that we're seeing in the liberalization because there was a feature um, for delivering calls for purchasing circuit. A, a T1 line in 1999 cost 40,000 US per month. If you're operating a call center business, one T1 line, 40,000 US per month. Today, that same T1 line, the equivalent, is 400 US dollars. Again, a part of the success in liberalization. And we've seen it also in the hotel construction. All of the, the, the improvements in telecommunications um, have driven these other areas, port development, the logistics industry, increased remittance flow, catalyst for e-commerce, and of course, it assists in other areas like education. I don't believe that in the last 50 years there has been any single policy action 
that have resulted in greater levels of investment and provided a greater Tazia Philip, but certainly no pun intended, to the Jamaican economy and society than liberalization. Associated with liberalization was our efforts at enabling broad access and to prevent the digital divide that we see emerging elsewhere. And that's the reason why we did establish this Universal Service Fund, which was to en ensure that Jamaicans weren't just going to be talking and talking and, and texting, but be a part of this knowledge-based world and that you need to have broadband technology to enable that. And I'm so pleased that we were able to initiate this, this facility that saw us realizing significant revenues from a, from a CES imposed on foreigners who call Jamaica. We have now established a fund of about $14 billion. And out of that, we've been able to establish community access points across the country, e-learning, um, our tablets in school program, and so on and so forth. An IMF report done in February of this year indicates that the digital sector, um, conservatively defined as the core activities of digitization, ICT goods and services, online platforms and platform enabled activities are up to 10% of most economies if measured by value added income or employment. When the digital sector is more broadly defined, China's digital economy amounts to 30% of GDP in 2016, moving from 5% in 2012. In 2017, the non-gasoline retailers in the UK made more than 16% of their sale online. And Eurostat data on the European Union shows that in 2016, 66% of household internet users made online purchases. So we believe that there's tremendous room for growth here. The even better news is there is still tremendous growth, room for growth in deriving economic benefits from the connected digital world. And I really want to commend all the telecoms firms for continuing to build out critical infrastructure that must support the growth in the digital economy. Of course, the build out in the digital backbone has been spurred by competition and by the rapid advance of technology that makes one technological application obsolete very quickly. There are some related things that have been done to support this substratum. So we have developed a regulatory environment that encourages uh, digital transactions. We have the E-Transaction Act, the Electronic Transaction Act. We have now legislation dealing with intellectual property, the protection of what is done online. Our copyright laws were updated to facilitate this. And of course, in this age of espionage, we do have now cybercrime legislation and so on and so forth. There have been some negatives to the digital expansion. One clear downside has been the growth in cybercrimes in recent years. The digital expansion was inevitable and is now really unstoppable. And so this calls for greater investment in preemptive technology and in cybersecurity. And even as a small country, we cannot take these issues lightly. So I'm pleased to have been able to play, play some part in the unfolding of what we are seeing today. I'm also prepared and ready to play an even greater role in the digital development in Jamaica. So we really ought to stay tuned. An audience such as this one would know only too well that in the digital era, marketing is not so much about selling as it is about sharing experiences, building relationships, and the people connecting with people through interaction. As you pursue these new dimensions to marketing through the digital platforms, you are connecting the dots of development through action from one decade to the next. You are keeping Jamaica connected to the mainstream of global financial flows. You are connecting to the opportunities created by the telecom civilization that I was involved with. So let us stay connected to a more glorious and a digitally safer future 
for generations to come. I hope I have delivered as your guest speaker. Thank you very much and have a wonderful seminar. Thank you.